I'm going to talk about symptom management for men with AMN. Um, and if anyone wants to interrupt along the way, they're very welcome. So I've given this talk before, but what we've had since I gave it before is this, which is a publication that came out earlier this year, driven by the Amsterdam group, Mark Engel, and with a whole load of international experts, including myself and a number of other people who at least were in the room at some point. They have it. I think Florian's left. Um, with some international recommendations for diagnosis and management of patients with adrenal leukodystrophy, including AMN. Why is that important? Well, it serves two purposes. These sort of guidelines are quite useful for telling clinicians how to manage patients, but actually, hopefully, most patients will be being seen by expert centres anyway who shouldn't need too much advice on what to do. But if there are people looking after patients who haven't seen them very often, which can happen outside centralised healthcare systems like ours, it can be useful. But the other thing they're very useful for is actually being able to point to guidelines to the people who pay for healthcare and commission it and say that actually these patients ought to be getting this sort of care. And that's actually in the NHS is probably a more important thing in trying to make sure that we're providing the best possible care, which is quite challenging in the NHS at the moment. Okay, so we'll look at the different features of adrenomyopathy, of the myelopathy um, and peripheral neuropathy you see in ALD in men. Um, I don't think we've got a point to have we, but um, I'm not going to talk very much about cerebral ALD. You'll hear more about that later. Um, it's going to be about the myeloneuropathy and to some extent the adrenal insufficiency. And I think women are being dealt with next door. So I've pulled out a number of the recommendations from that paper. So the first... Uh, recommendations, which are five and six, I think one to four were about diagnosis, uh, concern a multidisciplinary team of healthcare professionals. So there should actually be a multidisciplinary team looking after patients who have diseases that affect multiple systems. That makes sense. And here it's really the, the nervous system uh, and the endocrine system. So neurologists and endocrinologists are important. I'm a metabolic physician. What have I got to do with it? Um, <laughs> probably very little, but I can be a central coordinator, if you like. So it's also important to have a team who are make sure, responsible for making sure you can get the access you need from the other teams, urologists, neurologists, other people. So for a male patient, a neurologist, an endocrinologist or metabolic specialist, I think that was just put in for me. Um, a pediatrician, a genetic counselor should be consulted. Pediatricians are for children. Genetic counselor is important when you come to talk, thinking about uh, your reproductive choices. If we get on to treatment, there are lots of recommendations around treatment and treatment of the myeloneuropathy. So the first one there is a, points out to start off with that unfortunately at the moment treatment is still what we call supportive, so it's symptomatic. Unfortunately, we don't currently have anything that can, uh, that can delay what we call a disease-modifying therapy that modifies the course of the disease and its progression. And that's true of bone marrow transplantation as well. Unfortunately, we know that uh, young boys who were bone marrow transplanted successfully uh, for the leukodystrophy uh, will still go on and develop the myeloneuropathy. So the treatment is, is at the moment dealing with your symptoms rather than the underlying disease. And mostly it's things like pain and spasticity, functional ability and quality of life. You'll see there that actually no consensus was reached on how you do some of these things, but there is consensus on the fact that they need to be managed. Okay, so let's start with spasticity. So what is spasticity? Well, spasticity is uh, really an increase in the tone, in the stiffness of the muscles. And it happens when there is what we call an upper motor neuron lesion. So your muscles are controlled by two sets of neurons. There's a set of neurons up here in your brain that decide, well, when, you, that when your brain decides you want to move a limb, a leg, sends the message down through the brain and the spinal cord to another set of neurons in the spinal cord themselves, which are called the anterior horn cells. They sit in the front of the spinal cord that actually then send a message to the muscle telling it to move. If the neurons that are sending a message to the muscle telling it to move aren't working, then the muscle actually goes floppy, what we call flaccid. But if, the, if there's a problem between the neurons in the brain and the neuron in the spinal cord, then you get spasticity and the muscle actually contracts more than it usually would leading to stiffness, but also weakness. So that's 
an upper motor neuron rather than a lower motor neuron. What are the features? Well, you get brisk reflexes. So if you come to clinic, and we'll get you to sit on the bench and tap your knee reflexes, and the leg goes out much more uh, violently than other people. And clonus, that's when someone pulls on your ankle or on your knee, and you get the muscle actually pushes against it, beats against it. That's called ponus. But from symptomatically, you can get spasms, and they can be very painful, particularly in bed at night. Um, and problems with the walking, really, because of uh, the spasticity and stiffness in the muscles. And there's an example, probably sitting behind me, of what a spastic gait looks like. I don't think we need to tell anybody in this room what a spastic gait looks like. So what are the aims of treating spasticity? Well, you want to relieve pain and discomfort, and you want to improve functionality. So that involves posture, uh, being able to straighten the leg if you can, so you can sit comfortably, um, so you can stand and walk comfortably. Uh, there are issues with uh, improving day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activities of daily living. And then eventually preventing things such as pressure ulcers. So how do we do that? Well, we have a number of drugs that are available. Um, which are really aimed at reducing that increased tone, that increased stiffness in the muscles um, in no particular order, but normally baclofen, I think, would be tried first. So baclofen is a drug that we often start giving uh, in the evenings because people tend to complain of the stiffness at night, starting at a low dose and gradually titrating up, and you can go to quite high doses of baclofen. Like all of these drugs, it has side effects. Initially, in particular, it can make you feel quite sleepy. That's not such a problem if you're taking it last thing at night, but can be if you're taking it regularly during the day. Um, and also, in the longer term, it actually can cause weakness to the muscles. So often, uh, if you've got um, an upper motor neuron, if you've got spasticity, if you've got myelineuropathy, you're actually relying on the stiffness to give you the strength to stand up. So if we use baclofen and get rid of that stiffness, then all of a sudden the muscles aren't able to support your weight anymore, and though your legs may not be stiff, you may not be able to support yourself. So it's always very careful having to balance those things. And certainly for us, I'm not doing that, I'm not a neurologist. We have a special spasticity team with neurologists and physiotherapists who advise us on that. Other drugs, so tizanidine is another drug that has similar effects and can also be used. Um, it's what we call anticholinergic, so it can give you a dry mouth and a blurred vision and things. And then dantrolene, I don't think we use very much in this country. Uh, gabapentin, we're probably using more as an antispastic drug, and that also has the advantage that it can help with pain as well, with nerve pain. So I'm sure there are a number of drugs we can use alone or in combination. I seem to have gone backwards. Botulinum toxin I was going to talk about next. Um, so if the muscles are very stiff um, and are causing problems, you can actually try and paralyze them, and that's where botulinum toxin comes in. So when you're using it in the cosmetic industry, they're doing exactly the same thing. They're trying to paralyze muscles in the face that are causing wrinkles. Uh, we're trying to use it therapeutically to paralyze muscles or partially paralyze muscles where the the stiffness in the muscle is causing problems. Um, botulinum toxin is a sort of permanent poison uh, to the message getting to the muscle to telling it to contract. Um, permanent meaning it lasts for a few months. It will eventually wear off. You have to repeat it. The problem with botulinum toxin in the long term is you will end up losing power in the muscle. So if you use it forever, uh, you will end up with a paralyzed muscle anyway. That's just some common places to use it would be in the, the calf muscle because if that's tight it can keep the foot, keep the ankle up, make it difficult to put the foot flat on the ground. Other things, so baclofen can be given orally, baclofen can also be given directly into the fluid around the spinal column, what we call intrathecally. That involves having a procedure to put a needle into the spinal column, what we'd call a lumbar puncture, and then pass a little plastic catheter up there and then they can insert a pump, and that means the baclofen can be delivered uh, into, the, into the, the nerve roots themselves. That can be quite effective, but it is still uh, an experimental treatment, if you like. It is, actually, it is available in the NHS in certain centres, um, but isn't, there was, that's one of the things, there was no consensus on whether that really has a use here or not, but some people may have been offered it in the past. So that's drugs, medical ways of doing it. Just as important, probably, are the non-drug interventions for stiffness and things. So stretching and splinting. So 
physiotherapy and exercises. The problem with physiotherapy is unless, unfortunately here, we don't have the resources to give you a physiotherapist coming to your house every day, so they will give you exercises that you then have to do. Um, that's not always straightforward. Uh, splints, so a lot of people, again, sprinting around the ankle splints you wear in your shoes to keep your foot up are important. Um, functional electrical stimulation, which I think is the next one. So again, this is something we certainly offer. Uh, and for some people, one of the early problems in spastic is that you end up catching your toe. So you'll see people coming in, wearing through the fronts of their shoes, tripping over, and that's because you can't lift the foot um, for a combination of neuropathy uh, and myelopathy, nerve and spinal cord disease. And so functional electrical stimulation avoids the nerve and gives a message directly to that muscle to contract when you bring your foot through. So there's a box you wear on your hip that tells where your leg is. There are some wires that go down. And as you swing your leg through, instead of your toe catching, a message, an electrical shock goes down, the muscle contracts, and you clear your toe. And it could be very effective in helping some people to walk, certainly in the early chances of the disease. And then the other thing that's really important is mobility aids, be it sticks, crutches, frames, trolleys, wheelchairs, or buggies. They're all very important. I was talking at coffee to a couple of people saying, wouldn't it be nice if, as well as all the drug companies, uh, we had some mobility, mobility aids people coming along to these meetings to talk to people about what they actually need. Um, because a lot of these things are not perfect. Buggy might be fine for going along a nice, smooth pa pavement, but it's not great on the beach um, or going over the playing fields and things. Um, but one of the things that we tend to find about this is that people are very proud. They don't like using mobility aids unless they absolutely have to. Now, that's good. We would want you to keep mobile for as long as you possibly can. But if it's taking you half an hour to get down the shops, when is if you had a buggy, it would take you five minutes, you'd be able to get back and then go and do something in the garden or go down the gym, which would be much better. So I think people tend to, um, to use these things far too late. So they're there to prevent falls and to maintain independence, and that's important. Maintaining independence doesn't necessarily mean doing it yourself. Okay, other things, the peripheral nervous system, so the nerves are involved as well. That can lead to some of the problems like the foot drop we talked about with functional electrical stimulation. It also tends to lead to symptoms such as pain. Uh, so if you have peripheral neuropathy, you're, which means that the nerves to your feet in this case aren't working properly, uh, you don't feel things. So actually, you can end up injuring your feet without knowing about it. So it's very important to be careful to keep an eye on your toes and the bottom of your feet particularly because ulcers and things are difficult. Cutting your toenails, you may not notice if you cut yourself. But conversely, although you're not feeling pain when you should, you can also get a lot of pain when there's nothing there. So particularly in bed at night, people can get a lot of burning pain that affects sleep and things. And that can also be treated um, with drugs. So for the feet, it's important chiropody. So we like people to look after their feet properly and get someone to do that for them, because if you cut one of your toenails and don't realize you've done it, that can end up with nasty infections. Treating the pain with drugs such as amitriptyline, pregabalin, or pain clinic if needs be, they can do things like lignocaine injections in severe cases. And again, falls prevention is important. The bladder, I'm not gonna say a lot about the bladder, because I think there's a specific talk on managing the bladder tomorrow, but the nerves to the feet deal with pain and movement. The nerves to the bladder are very important in dealing with bladder function and making sure that your bladder fills normally and empties normally. And uh, in this condition and other ones like it, uh, disease in the nerves to the bladder lead to very unstable bladders with problems with what we call urgency, so having to rush off to the loo straight away, urging continence, not being able to get there in time. And that's treatable with various medicines and things. And you'll hear about that tomorrow, I hope. Okay, so that's quick whistle-stop tour through the neurological bits. Let's not forget adrenal insufficiency. So adrenal insufficiency is definitely more likely to occur earlier on than later on in life. Um, once you've uh, grown up, once you've developed the signs of adrenal neuropathy, it's much less likely that you're going to develop de novo adrenal insufficiency, but it can happen, and we do keep an eye on it. The adrenal glands are very important in producing 
a number of hormones, including the stress hormones that mean your, means your body can react properly with your infections and things. So the danger in Addison's disease, adrenal insufficiency, is that you think you're absolutely fine, you pick up a viral or a bacterial infection, and instead of fighting it off as you normally would, you become suddenly very unwell um, and end up having to go to hospital and needing a lot of intensive care. And that's dealt with by giving back the hormones that are missing, so uh, adrenal re replacement. So again, going back to the guidelines, all boys and men, but not girls and women, because it doesn't happen at all frequently in girls and women, should be routinely screened for adrenal insufficiency, so we do that with a blood test, um, and that they should be treated by an endocrinologist, really, uh, if, if it's detected. There are lots of different causes of adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease, endocrinologists, the doctors who deal with hormones in the body are the ones who are best at dealing with that, and so they should be looking after that. And what they'll do is give you back the hormones that you're, you're missing and make sure that you know that if you're unwell for any reason, if you've been exposed to infection, you take extra hormones. Okay, so I've done a whistle-stop whistle tour through uh, some of the symptomatic management, and we can deal with that later. I would say something very quickly about cerebral ALD as well, because I know we've got a few talks coming up on that, and we deal with it slightly differently, or not at all, in the NHS. So this is what we see on a brain MRI in cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, most often occurs in young boys, uh, where bone marrow transplant providing you get it early enough is the ideal treatment. But in the UK, and here's the, um, the guidelines for that, that all boys and men with ALD should be screened for cerebral ALD, even if they don't have any symptoms, because you want to get it early. So you, providing you pick up the disease early on in life, you do a baseline MRI, uh, you're screening boys every six months, and then annually from the age of 12. Again, doesn't need to be done in women with the idea that you pick up changes early and do a bone marrow transplant. The problem we have in the UK is that we've been able to do bone marrow transplants for ALD in boys up to the age of 18, but after 18, if you develop any of these changes, uh, we were no longer able to offer it. We are hoping that that is changing. There is now enough evidence from other countries that uh, you can successfully bone marrow transplant men as well as boys, that nothing magical happens when you're 18 that means it suddenly doesn't work anymore. Uh, and we have a policy going through NHS England at the moment, uh, which is pretty much there, I hope, that says that they will be able to offer the same treatment to adult males if they develop early signs of, of leukodystrophy as we do to boys. So hopefully, uh, going forward, we'll be able to continue offering that monitoring uh, and be, hopefully be able to, and it won't be, it's not very many people, uh, but be able to offer appropriate treatment much earlier on. Okay, I don't know if I caught up, but take home messages. Symptomatic treatment, best to try and avoid the symptoms if you can, so please stay mobile, but use aids when you need them. Uh, so it's important uh, to make sure you're using the aids so that you can get where you need to be, uh, rather than spending all the time getting there and being exhausted when you arrive and treat symptoms before they become a major problem, which is really saying the same thing. I might have caught up a bit, but not very much, Karen. I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you, Robert.